So thank you for joining us for the first Zoom WAM seminar of the term. Our speaker is Professor Arnab Pal from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, India. Uh, Dr. Pal got his PhD from the Raman Research Institute and then moved to the Technion where he did his first postdoc um, and then continued over there in Israel uh, at, the, at Tel Aviv University where he did a second postdoc in the broad area of statistical mechanics, probability theory, um, particularly in the connection problems in physical chemistry. Uh, he started at IIT Kanpur a year and a half ago, two years ago in August, uh, of 2021, and for the last 10 months, uh, he has been at Chennai. Um, as I said before, his area of interest and expertise broadly is in non-equilibrium transport phenomena, and particularly in the context of complex search processes. And he's going to tell us something today about what I think is a very beautiful topic, which is uh, resetting uh, fun from fundamentals and uh, towards applications. So thank you very much for joining us. So uh, thanks, Madhavan, for the kind inv invitation and also for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, so uh, I, I slightly changed the title of uh, of my talk. I mean, and the, the plan is essentially to, you know, like uh, give a brief introduction of the topic itself and uh, try to give some flavor of the applications we are having with this, this topic. So before I start, uh, let me just, uh, okay. So basically, I, I started my group uh, only very recently. Uh, uh, we are a set of people uh, who are interested in complex systems in general, which are governed by statistical events or uh, you know like random events, and uh, they are prevalent in nature. And we we basically try use a combination of uh, different kind of mathematical modeling, computer simulations, and data analysis to analyze them. Uh, and beyond that, also we are pretty much interested in non-equilibrium physics. Uh, you know, like unlike equilibrium physics, when where we have the Boltzmann formula or the partition function, non-equilibrium physics doesn't really have a concrete structure, and the, the understanding still remains quite elusive. So I, I basically uh, try to look into them uh, from different perspectives. Uh, also, I'm quite quite interested in doing some experiments. Uh, I personally don't do it, but I collaborate with people who do the experiments and try to. And I try to understand, you know, like uh, the, the exotic non-equilibrium phenomena, sometimes this kind of systems feature. So with this, uh, just let me just get into the topic of uh, the talk today. Uh, so, uh, you know, like we all know that we, we, are, we should be, you know, like familiar with the topic restart or reset, right? Because it's quite ubiquitous in our mind. So it's, we always say that, okay, it's be often better to restart, you know, like whether it's restarting your computer or, anything else, whatever you are doing, you just leave it and say that, okay, we'll just give it a fresh start tomorrow and let's see how it goes, right? So uh, so I, I just want to give you some sort of a brief, you know, like uh, introduction to this. So just let's look at a, you know, like a two dimensional panel over here. So bad weather could compel a group of searchers over here uh, shown by different arrows looking for a target and, uh, you know, like they can seize their effort and return to the base. By the time they return, uh, by the time, you know, like they restart their search in the next day or a few days later, maybe the target might have moved. So what they have to do is now they have to actually come up with a different strategy or restart their strategy. So similar kind of things also can happen in computer algorithms. So uh, let's say the computer algorithm works as a black box, which tries to find an optimal solution among many other, many possibilities. And chances may say in the algorithm the, all the way, uh, all the wrong way. And you know, like it can take longer time for the process to find the optimal solution. So in such cases, timely restart uh, can actually uh, can help you a lot. So oh, while uh, all these things are good and fine, uh, so there is some noise uh, in the background. Uh, so, uh, but then uh, restart also has emerged as a natural phenomena in somewhat unsimilarly related phenomena. So I will try to, you know, like uh, catch up on some of these. So one is the enzymatic reaction or uh, chemical uh, reaction in general. So here, what you see is uh, a typical Michaelis Menten kind of reaction. So where an enzyme reversibly binds with the substrate, a substrate to, to form a metastable state. And from this state, two things can happen. Either catalysis can happen or the, you know, like an unbinding event can happen, which basically releases the enzyme from the substrate. 
And so the substrate is again, the enzyme is again free to operate uh, with another substrate and things like that. So I hope that at the, by the end of the talk, I will be able to convince you this unbinding events is exactly like, like a restart event. Uh, so this is this will be one of the one of the main uh, themes which I would like to you know like uh, convince you with. Uh, so another another uh, again another uh, totally seemingly unrelated phenomena is the so-called facilitated diffusion. So this is an artistic view of protein DNA interaction where you have a protein and then which is basically trying to find some sort of a targeted base pairs along the long DNA, and it's a very long uh, DNA. So but then the, the protein has to do it quite efficiently. So it does, it's basically mixes between some sort of a, a hopping or jumping and some sort of a sliding phase. So it mixes and matches between these two motion to efficiently find uh, these targeted sites. Uh, I will also get back to this uh, at some point of time. Uh, so uh, to, to briefly tell you what is restart and reset, so I, I thought maybe it is for the best of all of our interest if we just do some basic elementary exercise. So what we are seeing here, so I, I have like just a one dimensional line. I have a starting point over here. I have a finishing point and I, I, just, I, I just have a particle. So this particle is not diffusing or something. It's just a Newtonian particle. It has a velocity towards, the, uh, towards this finishing point and the distance is L, right? So, you know, like nothing fancy happens, the particle starts, it reaches there. So the time is just L by V, right? Okay, that's it. So let's take the same particle and let us try to understand what resetting actually means. So the particle starts, it's moving, and I just reset. Okay, what does it mean? So I have some sort of an external agent, which has a clock, and this clock gives me some random time. And whenever this happens, I, I catch the particle there, and then teleport it back to the starting point. So here I am not, I am unable to show you the teleportation, but just let us assume that when the reset event happened, I just immediately instantaneously switched the particle to the starting point and from where it again starts its search. You know, and because the, the time is random, basically the time of restart is random. So now you need to talk about some sort of a random averaging, right? And more than that, now, our intuition, of course, tells us that this T should be greater than L by V, right? Because of the restart, you have this additional time. And so it, the time should be larger than L by V. This is something which you understand. So this is a very simple process. We understood that restart in this process basically hindered the search. So now we just switch this simple uh, Newtonian particle with a, with a Brownian particle. Again, the same one dimensional setup you have a Brownian particle over. So the Brownian particle, it basically diffuses, right? And then given enough long, uh, given long enough time, thermal fluctuation essentially will take the particle to the finish point, right? This is something which we know. And in one dimension, you can actually, uh, you can compute the first passage time distribution uh, uh, for, for this process. And it, it was first derived by Levy or Polya for that matter. And what, what they showed that the mean time in one dimension, actually it is infinite, okay? So the time it takes for, the, for this diffusing particle, you know, like to, to reach any finite point, the mean time is actually infinite. Uh, it's in 1D. So uh, if you wanted to understand what happens to the same, you know, like same particle when it is subject, uh, subjected to a resetting phenomena. So again, the, the particle diffuses, Resetting happens, so basically there is an agent, you know, like it has a random clock, gives you some time, you put it back immediately to the starting point, and then it again starts diffusing from there. And let's say after some time, it eventually reaches to the finishing point, right? So a typical trajectory would look like uh, what I have shown on the right hand side. So it starts from the zero, let's say that is my starting point. I have to reach this specific targeted uh, play, which is let's just call it L or something. and I have this stochastic trajectory, which is getting, you know, like interrupted by these resetting events. And every time resetting happens, I put this particle back to the starting point instantaneously, where from it starts again its search. And let's say that at some random time, it will reach to the desired target, right? So I am just interested. Now this, this time itself, the first passage time, um, itself is random because of the two reasons. One is the, the motion of the, the dynamics itself is random because it's a diffusing particle. And second is there is a temporal randomness because of the resetting. 
So, so I need to talk about some sort of an average in quantity. So let us do a simulation, calculate the mean, uh, calculate the mean mean time, and try to plot it as a function of resetting rate. Okay, that that should be some sort of a first exercise, let's say. Okay, so there is some curve we get. Let's try to understand what is going on here. So as you see that, you know, like I have plotted with, with, uh, as a function of resetting rate. So when resetting rate is very small, as expected is basically going to the Brownian limit and then the mean time essentially diverges. But on the other hand, if you see when you have a very large resetting rate, then you are not really allowing the particle to move much. So it is almost confined very close to the resetting point. And so also it takes very long uh, for the particle to reach to the desired target. But quite remarkably, in between, you see that there is actually a bunch of rates for which the mean time, the mean recent, the mean first passage time has has been dramatically reduced. Okay, this is this is the catching point here. Okay, and on top of that, there is also an optimal resetting existence of an optimal resetting. So so you, you not only reduce you not only reduce the mean time, but also you can you know like come up with an optimal resetting which which will work in the most efficient way. So what you have for the simple diffusing, uh, pro diffusing search process, which was not an efficient process at all, by doing the simple mechanism of resetting, uh, you, you just basically uh, made, made it at least uh, efficient in, in quite some order. So in this process, what we saw that resetting actually expedites the, the mean first passage time, right? So for, for at least for simple diffusing process. So this was, a, you know, like this was the, the initial work by Martin Vance and Satya Mojundar in the, almost like 10 years back, which basically opened up this entire field. And uh, we have seen quite a growth uh, around this area. So uh, let me give you another exercise, let's say, uh, and then we will get to the, to the, you know, like the physical reasoning why it is happening. So let's you know like uh, consider a situation when you have again let's say a Brownian particle diffusing, but then there is an unbounded landscape over here, and the, let's say that the particle starts at x naught, and the aim the, the the aim is basically to find the time the particle takes essentially to reach uh, to the uh, to the top of the hill, right? So this is this is the basically what I am simply asking for, right? So as we know, like the typical intuition says that without, if you just let the particle uh, be there, so the, the potential will drag it all the way down to infinite, infinity, and then the mean threshold reaching time will be again, will, uh, should diverge, right? So with this, but we, we try to understand that, okay, let's again, you know, play the same game, just add this resetting phenomena. So what is happening is that you again, you know, like let the particle diffuse wherever it is, but you then bring it back again and again with some rate r to the initial position x naught, right? Okay, so this is something which you do. And the first thing you want to understand is how the position distribution of this particle actually is spread, right, around x naught. This is something which you would like to see. So that is what I have been plotting here. So you see that suddenly, you know, like in general, if, we, if you do not really have a resetting, there is no uh, equilibrium or steady state for that matter because the particle runs to infinity. But in this case, suddenly we see some sort of a, you know, like a time independent state at a large time. And so where we see that the, there is a, some sort of a peak uh, of this position density just at the resetting point x naught. And then what we see is that there is some sort of, some sort of a spillover of the probability density also across the origin, right? This, this is interesting. Because this essentially tells that there is a finite probability that you can find the particle also around zero and beyond, basically to the left also, right? This is what it says. And so naturally, the mean time, mean threshold or mean first passage time then should not be infinite anymore because there is a finite probability for the for the for you to find the particle at the around the origin. So this essentially, uh, you, you know, like these are the two phenomena which I will be talking about again and again. One is that is spatial behavior and one is basically the temporal behavior. And if you will see like the way I have tried to, you know, like give you an example here and how they, they talk to each other. So, so before that, I mean, maybe, maybe it is better, you know, like I, I, I just basically give you the, the rule of the game over here. So we have a very simple process like an over time Langevin equation here. So with some probability R delta T, you just put the particle back to the initial position X naught. Otherwise, it just simply diffuses, right? So I have a simple diffusion in a potential landscape 
So V is my potential, and then eta is just the thermal peak, right? And that happens with a complementary probability, right? This is what I want. Now I, I, I can with from this we can actually construct a, so to speak a master equation or a balance equation for that matter. And you, you see that because of the simple diffusion and the potential, we have a very standard first two terms on the right hand side, right? These are the very standard terms. But then we have these two additional terms. One is this minus RP. Why, why, why this appears? Because you basically taking the probabilities all from all the phase space and putting it back to some specific place, which is X naught. So which is basically the incoming flux only available at X naught, but then the outgoing flux is essentially from everywhere in phase space, right? Except for the X naught. So this is actually a balance equation. Just note that there is, uh, that there is a, that the, this equation basically conserves probabilities. There is no sinking of the probability uh, anywhere. And we are, if you're looking at a very large time, so we can just kill the left hand side and the solution, uh, whatever solution we get, that should give us basically the steady state. Okay. And so now uh, the first example is, I, I just want to give you basically the first example. Just let's just imagine that you do not have the potential, just the simple diffusing particle. So we know that for the simple diffusion, diffusing particle, the, the probability distribution is just simple Gaussian, which where the mean square displacement essentially, you know, like increase with time, right? But quite remarkably, what we see here, and that's actually a non-equilibrium, non-stationary state, because the system is always out of equilibrium for simple Brownian dynamics. But what you what we see this by solving this particular equation, we see that there is a stationary state which is time independent, and it looks like some sort of a Boltzmannian shape you know like it's we know that it's not a boltzmann distribution because there is a current in the system but because of this rate which you're basically playing around with but nevertheless the most important fact is that there is actually a time independent state okay and that is uh, picked around the resetting point this is this is this is the input this point transition feature of this particular problem this sort of you know like now if i go back uh, to this uh, you know like this plot I think we can we can already we can see that this also looks like an exponential with two z and then there is a kink at x is about x naught where we see that the cusp. So what is what is happening here that the particle it kind of diffuses, but it actually doesn't it cannot diffuse much okay because of the resetting. So re resetting what it does is actually cuts short the errand trajectories you are having. There, there are some detrimental trajectories right. Which basically take the which take the particle away from the target, right? So resetting eventually doesn't allow this, you know, like the, this long excursions and cuts it short, and effectively puts them in in an effective confinement, which is some sort of we can say it's an effective potential, which you were seeing. It's not really a, you know, like it's not really a potential because you see this is a V effective, right? And then you see because you you did not have any real potential here, it just form looks like a potential. And which is basically happening because there is some sort of an effective attraction, uh, or, uh, you know, like uh, exactly at x is equal to x naught because of the resetting. Can I ask a question over here? You've chosen please, please. x naught to be fixed. Are you going to tell us a little more about what happens if x naught itself is random? So random reset when the position itself, because in search, sometimes you go back to the original, but often right. you may want to sample different parts of the domain, maybe you're going to talk about this later. In which case, I'll just... so uh, we we are not. I, I'm not going to get into the random initial position or random resetting position. Actually, in my talk today, because you will see that even the uh, you know like quenched condition itself uh, can give you a plethora of you know like beautiful results. But we have analyzed also in details uh, this annealed condition where you have this random a uh, resetting position. But you see that when you do random resetting position, then you know like the surprise is. While the for the search, it is actually quite evident you need to have you know like random initial conditions, but at least for colloidal systems or diffusing systems, you can already see that if you just randomly you know like reset the particle, so the the probability to reach the the target is even higher, right? Because you know like you will of course you will do also the other side, but you will also do very close to the. It depends on the distribution of the x naught which you are going to choose. So, but uh, just I just want to mention that you know, like we have studied that also uh, quite well. 
But today's talk will be focusing only on the quenched condition where you have a fixed x naught. Okay, so well, I, I think I, I sort of try to give you some sort of a flavor of you know like how uh, resetting works. Uh, so now that was some sort of a spatial behavior. I just want to move towards the temporal behavior this time because we were talking about the mean time, etc., and all right. So, so, so to, to do that, so let's again uh, go back and think about it, right? The way we saw the earlier trajectory. So let's just consider a generic search process. We have a target over here. The reflect there's a, we have just put a reflective boundary here, but it is you know like it's not important. It has no certain role here, so to speak. So the, the position the, the particle essentially does diffusion or some other you know like generic stochastic process and let's say it finds the target. So every time it finds the target, you say that the pro process has completed. You carry the time. You put it somewhere, right? So particle starts again. Process completes. You put the time again. But then once in a while you could also have a reset. Then the trajectory, this blue trajectory, right? It will basically be interrupted with this resetting events, which will put it back uh, to the initial position. From there, actually, it, it will start uh, its search again, right? So if I have to write this equation without even thinking about what are the underlying dynamics, whether it's a Brownian motion or it's a Brownian motion in a potential or some sort of anomalous dynamics, what I, I should be thinking about this problem is like as if there are some times, some random times, and there are some interplays between these random times, right? So one is the first passage time coming, uh, gener being generated from some underlying dynamics. Doesn't matter whether it's a diffusion or anomalous, anomalous dynamic, anomalous diffusion or something else. And then resetting clock, which also can come from some arbitrary times, right? Arbitrary clock. So I should be basically, there is some sort of interplay between resetting clock and first passage time clock. So we should be just talk about some sort of resetting, some sort of a temporal events. So I have a start, I have a finish, and then, you know, like it's a generic search process. So if the process starts and finishes without any issue, uh, without any interruption, so we just say that, okay, TR is exactly T, T is basically the first underlying first passage process. And this will happen when you know for sure the first passage actually has happened, happened before any restart could happen, right? That is the first condition. Otherwise, what can happen? So let's say that you are just going as exactly like here. So restart can, you know, like happen in between. So when restart happens, so you go back to the initial state and you start search again, right? So then there is a delay incurred because of the resetting, which I'm just calling it R. This is a random variable. And then after it resets to the initial condition, again, the search starts, right? So this, is, this should be a fresh start, right? It's a start from scratch. So this is exactly TR, but then it's an IID copy, right? So it's not exactly the same random variable, but it's an IID copy. It comes from the same distribution, but this is conditioned on the fact that multiple resets have happened before the first passage. So this is the central equation. And you know, like you will see the appearance of this equation uh, many times in my talk in different contexts. And, uh, and this is something which we call renewal equation in time. And you see that there is no space here. So we don't really care whether this T or R, what kind of, from what kind of distribution they are being drawn from, uh, there is no mention about that at all here. So that's the reason why it is so very general. Uh, so we can just close the relation. So I'm not uh, showing you the details here. And what finally you get is this very simple form of the mean first passage time under resetting. So you, you see that I have uh, a numerator, I have a denominator. And if, if you think about it, not only from the analytical perspective, but from a numerical perspective, so let's say that you have a search process where you cannot actually calculate anything analytically, let's say. But let's say that you can just say you have just a black box, and but you can do simulations, and that simulation gives you a distribution for T, uh, a data set for R, right? So you can just plug and play uh, using this, you know, like this formula where you just numerator, you just take T and R, the two data set, calculate this minimum of T and R, which is another random variable to the ensemble average, you just get the numerator. Similarly, you can do the also the denominator. So, you know, like this is the way, this is the reason why I think it is quite powerful and has been used, uh, you know, like uh, quite rigorously over the years. Uh, for rate limiting restart process, so what I mean by rate limiting process, when you just assume if a, a simple a simplification by saying the resetting is happening with an exponential clock or resetting is basically a Poissonian process, 
So the formulas are in the, the, is slightly simplified, and uh, this is uh, this is what I just wanted to. Why this t tilde r? I, I I did not mention here. It's just the moment generating function for the first passage. So this is the this is sort of the the the, uh, the, the main result. So now the question is, I I what I have shown here, I, I gave you basically three examples, right? So each variance over there carried its own intriguing features. In some cases, restart expedited the search. In some cases, restart delayed the process. So, so we want to understand when restart is going to be beneficial, right? So to do that, you can just imagine a first passage process and just tune, just add a very small resetting rate and see its effect, which essentially means that I have this guy over here and then I have this resetting rate, and but let us make it very small and do a, some sort of Taylor expansion. That's it, right? Because I want to understand the effect of resetting, right? So I, I, I just do that. When I do the Taylor expansion, I have this following result up to some order delta, where delta is very small. So the, the first term on the right-hand side is basically the, the mean first passage time without resetting. And then there is another term, which is basically linear order. So now the left hand side, because we are saying that if we want to, if the the the, the mean time with the, with reset, if it has to be lower than the mean time without resetting, so this term has to be negative, right? So this is this is the this is the simplest condition one can uh, one can have, and you just readjust this, and it gives you a condition on the randomness parameter or the coefficient of vari variation, some sort of a statistical dispersion. Which uh, goes by the 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 very uh, the standard deviation by the mean, and it has to be greater than one. Okay, so this actually it, this is something which we call restart criteria, and you see that this is actually a very universal criteria, because what is happening here that uh, you, to understand the effect of restart, what we are claiming is that you need to look into the underlying process, the process without restart, and then measure the two statistical measure right one is the fluctuation one is the mean take the ratio calculate the coefficient of variation if this is greater than one then you are guaranteed that restart will help you okay and this also this when you do this you know like uh, when you calculate this the, i have not assumed any particular again you know any structure of the underlying process or anything like that so this criteria should hold for arbitrary stochastic process okay except for the cases where the mean is diverging or so for like for example diffusion because those cases are actually pathological and we know that for if you have diffusion diffusion kind of process adding any kind of restart rate will always help the process okay so what actually cv greater than one means right so essentially if you look at it so if you if you think about the first example which was sort of like a you know like a ball which was moving newtonian particle moving towards the target almost deterministically so basically this is exactly a process where you you have a very narrow cv because there are hardly any fluctuation because cv basically measures fluctuations right so you have a very narrow cv and in these kind of processes restart will always hinder the search on the other hand when you have a very broad cv like for example, what you see here on the, on the right hand side, where you could have a power or tail or something like that. So restart will always expedite the process. So this is essentially how you can understand in terms of probability that for what kind of process or what kind of underlying process a resetting will be helpful. So we, we basically, uh, you know, like over the years, we have tried many different mathematical ways to formulate this, but I would also like to take a, take a moment also to give you some sort of a very simple probabilistic interpretation of this, uh, this criteria over here. Uh, and that uh, goes under the name of inspection paradox. So this inspection paradox was, you know, beautifully illustrated by William Taylor in his second, uh, uh, you know, like in his second book of probability theory. And uh, this is actually very simple, okay. So before that, it just, let's just think about a simpler setup. So let's say that you go to your favorite bus stop and the buses come there deterministically and then they leave, right? And let's say a random passenger arrives at any point of time and you know, like it, uh, it waits for the bus. Uh, this random passenger waits for the bus and the bus comes and then you know, like over it, it, this random passenger can have arrive many times and calculate the time it has to wait over the what a very long period of time. And this time apparently becomes T by two. 
the, where the t is basically the uh, the deterministic time between two buses coming right but we know that this is the case for the deterministic uh, arrivals but in general we know in general the buses never really come with a deterministic time scale so they have some sort of a fluctuation and we'll say that this fluctuation actually have to do with everything okay so this is what i what i show here so you see that this is a timeline where you know these black circles essentially show uh, black black circles show the, the arrival of buses and this t1 t2 uh, tn these are essentially let's say the waiting time between the buses okay and they are drawn and the, the average of that is just given by this uh, t angular bracket okay so this is a process we know what is happening now you being an arrive uh, as a passenger you arrive at a random point of time okay in the in in, in the in the bus stop okay and whenever you arrive you know like sometimes the bus can be there sometimes may not be there but you wait for some time right so this time let's just call it a residual time okay so in principle uh you know like you again you can arrive again and again and again and then you can just do an another ensemble which is basically a t residual average right now the question is that your natural intuition would be if two buses the if the mean waiting time between two buses is just t average right t angular bracket so the waiting time the residual time should be you know like always should be less than that right so this is the counterintuitive result that actually it is not always true okay while for the deterministic case is exactly t by 2 which is basically smaller but in most of the cases it actually it is greater than that and the most surprising fact is that if you have a large fluctuations in the bus arrivals so let's say that uh, you know like you have a very large fluctuation the cv essentially uh, the, the 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 cv measure which i just mentioned if if you can just measure that if you can if, if you know that the cv is actually quite large in this case what will happen the residual time will be larger than the, the mean arrival of the bus this is the counter counterintuitive result here okay so essentially what what i what i'm trying to me say is that on an average you will be waiting at the bus stop longer than the mean arrival term times of the buses okay and this is actually happening because you know like the buses are arriving at random times some intervals are bigger some intervals are shorter and you are most likely to arrive at the longer intervals okay or at the residual time for you is actually greater than the, the typical arrival time of the buses. And this is basically what is causing it. This is basically a problem of sampling bias. And uh, this gives rise to this so-called inspection paradox. Well, how this is related to the resetting, let's try to understand it, right? So what we have, we are just plotting another trajectory, two trajectories here. So you see that this is one trajectory, blue is one trajectory, you know, like it it's going on. And then this blue trajectory, what is happening is that it get basically it finds the target uninteracted. There is no resetting, right? And then there is another event where you actually reset the process, which is basically you, you have the rest of the trajectory, where it, which is basically yellow. You have reset it, so it goes back. And then it again, you know, like does the diffusion or whatever stochastic process, and it finds the target, right? Basically, these are the, so in one case, you just inspect you arrive at some arbitrary point, right? Like the buses, like, like the passenger in a bus stop, right? We arrive and just wait for the, the process to end. That is my residual time. This is what I call residual time. In another case, you arrive, but then you reset the process, right? This is what we have been doing in the resetting phenomenon. We arrive and then we reset. So this is what is happening to the yellow trajectory, right? So we have these two trajectories and on an average, one can actually show by sim very simple mathematics, this T residual average actually is given by T squared by 2T, okay? This is, a, there is a very simple derivation for this. I'm not going to show you that, but this is the, this is the expression for that. So now we know that when resetting will be helpful because uh, when this T residual time, right, it has to be greater than the, 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 the T average itself, because when you reset, you know, like the rest time is just simple T, right? So this is the criteria which you should be getting from here. Sorry, I don't understand that expression. I, is, uh, maybe I can't, can't read it properly. Is there a T average in the absence and T average in the presence? Because it seems like the T average is appearing on both sides of the equation. Right, so basically what I, what I meant here 
is this t average is basically when you restart the process the race process is t average if you see if you follow the yellow trajectory right yeah. the race time on remaining time is t on the other hand you have this t residual which where actually you did not do you did not really disturb the trajectory you just inspected the trajectory like the, the, the arrival of the buses right that the problem over there you have this t residual right so this on the right hand side I actually have written the t residual the t residual exact expression for t t residual is exactly given by t square by 2t this is the ex formal expression for t residual so the the condition basically we are utilizing the inspection paradox so to speak right the condition for inspection paradox is t race has to be greater than t the formal expression for t race as you can derive it to be t square by 2t and you know like you can implement this and this will give rise to the same t cv greater than one criteria Yeah, was was that clear or uh, uh, what your verbal explanation is clear but the equation uh, to me doesn't make sense because you have yeah to... so basically what i'm trying to show here so i should have written t race so the, no, that's what the, I thought. Okay. this the is right basically t, this is basically the formal expression for t race that's Thank all you. okay you can derive it by simple probabilistic so this is basically the you know like the entire you know like uh, all this resetting phenomena whatever we have done this is the general restart criteria can be understood uh, by the simple inspection paradox, which we have just realized uh, only very recently. Okay, I, I think I, I, I will just try to you know like push it slightly. Uh, so, uh, so as you know, like there are many different search processes, and um, we were you know like doing while well, we're doing resetting, uh, you know like different type of resetting problems. Uh, this article particularly you know caught our attention. So this is uh, what you see here. Basically, uh, this is uh, these are basically sea gannet. So it's sea gannets. This is some sort of a first rock island near Scotland, and this is one of the largest breeding ground. And what on the left hand side, what you see is basically the four adult birds. Okay, they are basically being tracked uh, by GPS loggers, and they they excurs. This is the yellow spots is basically the breeding ground, and then they go out for mating resources, whatever, and then they come back. They return to the home, and then they go back. They go out again. Uh, on the right hand side, what you see is basically uh, is immature granites, and the as you can see that their excursion path is way longer, right? But at the end of the day, it seems that they all come back home, right? This should not be very surprising to us because you know, like it was also remarked by the you know, like uh, remarked by Darwin quite long term back that you know, like most of the animals and plants keep to their proper homes and do not needless to wander about. And we see this even with migratory birds, which almost return to the same spot. Okay, so the take-home message uh, for us from here was that you know, like uh, many such processes are conducted in the vicinity of their home or some sort of a favored location, right? So if if you see that uh, animals they return to the their nests or dens, and then when they go back, they stay there, they take rest, and then they go out. Drones, mechanical machines, you know, like uh, they go to the docking station for refueling, etc. So it seems that the search processes, while you could be having some sort of a free range search, while you can see for butterflies, which do not really have a permanent dwelling, but on the other hand, you could have bees, dumbbell bees. So where you actually they have hives. So they go out for search, as I, as I have tried to show on the right hand side. So they go out for search, and let's say that they are unsuccessful. So they just decide at some point of time that, okay, we should just return back to our hive. And once they return, they, they stay for some time at home and then they, you know, like restart their search. So this home return is something which is reminiscent of uh, restart here, because when re the, the search starts on the next day, it's, we are considering it to be a fresh, you know, like a fresh start. So we can just play the same game as before. So where we have, told uh, we have we have shown before that okay if we start offer you know like if you have been able to find a target successfully game is over otherwise you know like you return home and then uh, your return could be some sort of it can take time un unlike previous cases where you had a instantaneous resetting but then you could have a waiting time but then again this tr prime essentially is the cache of the thing here it essentially means that there's the same random variable which appears here so we are saying that after it returns home, it 
you know, like it restarts as such. So it has forgot everything which has happened before. So there is no cognition as such carrying forward. And the question is whether this kind of re home return, so to speak, or, you know, like some sort of resetting, which we call this also, whether, you know, like whether it will be useful. Okay. And uh, as, we, as, we, as we are talking about it, we have been also able to show that this kind of, you know, finite time resetting is also useful in, in experimental setups. Uh, I will not have much time actually to talk about it today. Uh, so I just wanted to show that uh, the finite time resetting is also important uh, for also other kind of setups. Uh, so uh, to, to numerically, you know, like validate our theory. So what we looked upon is basically the classic levy work searches, which have been studied very well in the context of origin theory. So you have levy works, essentially, you have uh, power law waiting times. And uh, within these waiting times, the, the worker or the searcher basically moves with a constant velocity. And again, in that some, some sort of, there is a turning point at the end of that time. So where the random, again, uh, another random time is drawn from some power law distribution and again, the searcher works. So we just wanted to, you know, like verify our, this home range principle, uh, within the context of resetting and whether this kind of resetting or home return is beneficial at all. So what we did, we did, basically took the same levy search process, which have been studied well, but we just put them in some sort of a domain in the presence of uh, many targets and we had a home. So these levy workers, you know, like they go out and all, if, if they find the target, the success, it's a success process. Otherwise they, they return back to their home. And when it returns back, they start fresh next day. So the, the, the and I, I show some numerical results over here. The, the take home message from here is that the reduction in the mean time, which is now we, we see we are getting used to it because I have also shown you before in other examples that it's becoming typical. But more importantly here, it seems that the, by bringing back the particle, you know, like all the, the home return, it also reduces the fluctuations in search time. So not only on the average, but also on the level of fluctuation, you have been able to reduce uh, the efficiency of the process. So this is something, uh, you know, like we have recently done on the context of macroscopic search, uh, but also we have microscopic search. So I, I try to convince you that uh, we'll get back to this. Uh, so this is a very classic process uh, of facilitated diffusion. So what is happening here is that you have a very long DNA molecule and some, there are some targeted sequences which the protein has to find, right? And then this is basically this target sequence is order of very small in compared to the size of the DNA. And this is, of course, it's uh, important for many different types of enzymatic activities. I'm not getting into that, but the, the key challenges here are essentially two. One is the thermodynamical issues where it has to, you know, like find, uh, find the target uh, within the energy budget. And then there is also, you know, like it cannot really take infinite time to find this target, right? So this is essentially, these are the two observations people had in mind. And then there, there are some seminal works uh, by people, experimental groups from different places, uh, which, and then the, the bottom line was from this experiment that there is something called intermittent search strategy, which is basically taking place here. So what is the intermittent search process strategy here? So you see that when the, the protein uh, hops along the, 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 initially people thought that the protein essentially hops along the, three, uh, the DNA. So when it hops, basically it goes from one plane to another plane, so it's like a 3D jumps, okay? And they thought this is actually the, the efficient way of finding the, uh, the targeted site. And the rate was measured for corresponding to this particular process and it was it was it was seen that the experimental value and this uh, you know like this simulated or the analytical values they actually differ quite a bit. Okay, so then uh, also over the years people realized that actually it is not only three D jumps but also there are one dimensional sliding motion, some sort of diffusing motion, which in fact allows the protein to find the targets. Okay, so this is actually a combination of uh, you know like one D diffusion and 3D hops, and this is the reason why it's called a facilitated diffusion, which makes the search two orders magnitude faster, you know, like than, than the simple 3D diffusion. So this is what, you know, like we call intermittent search strategy because during these 3D jumps, the protein doesn't find the target. So it's like a blind phase, 
but then there is another phase which is the one dimensional sliding phase where actually protein can find the target so this is what we call intermittent uh, search strategy and uh, and using this you know like uh, people could show that in fact the results which were found in experiments and the theoretical modelings they started fitting uh, with each other okay so all these things were done before but so what 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 is what i'm talking about so i just want to convince you that this exactly falls into the framework of resetting and i believe that people actually have not thought about it before perhaps uh, at least i have not seen any papers on this particular uh, within using this resetting framework so what is happening i'm just considering this you know dna molecule a simple a simplistic version of it so a protein comes and binds to an arbitrary point and let's say that it does this one dimensional diffusion where the target is over here it tries to find it so let's say that it finds it so there is a success by one dimensional sliding so i can just write the completion time as this with some sort of a you know like conditionally but then the the protein also can dissociate from this right as we have as we have uh, just mentioned so it can dissociate and then it can do a 3d jumps relocate this is what we call relocation in three dimensional plane and then appears it can appear on you know, another different location along the dna so when it appears on another another location like here it doesn't remember where from it jumped okay this is this is an assumption okay this is an assumption we are making but i will show this assumption actually is pretty good enough so then what happens in this particular case you say that okay i have a time for this dissociation and then there is a time for relocation okay and then when it again comes back to another arbitrary point in the dna so it has forget about it so the search must be a new one right so i have the same process again repeating you can you are, are almost getting familiar with the structure now and you know like you can now close these equations get a mean and i'm not getting into the skipping all the details i i can show that the mean search time actually goes like this there is some sort of a mathematical expression uh, do not get bothered by this but the essential point is if you plot this as a function of lambda 1 which is basically the dissociation rate you see this kind of non monotonic behavior right and this is what people actually have seen before in many of many other literature so i i just wanted to emphasize on this particular point that resetting uh, the concept of resetting if you if you can identify the the the, the exactly the resetting events in many different stochastic processes there is a beautiful way uh, this beautiful renewal framework which you can use and it actually allows us to not only to the mean but also higher moments and uh, you know like even to the distribution okay which is usually very difficult to do with uh, other typical uh, uh, other type of approach and so just just to basically cover uh, some more complex scenarios so you can also imagine as i have already stressed that you do not really think about these random variables coming from some particular underlying dynamics it could be something is some 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 very arbitrary so it could be it could be having some sort of anomalous dynamic diffusion and then uh, you could have multiple targets multiple detected sites which need to be found so that also can be done within this framework and then there were also proposals where you know like then there could be crowding etc and in this kind of cases the hopping the, the hopping time will will not be arbitrary in the sense like it will also depend from where it jumped so it will depend on the coordinate and this kind of correlation also is possible and uh, and you know like the renewal framework or the, the framework of resetting beautifully works also for these kind of scenarios so this is something which i i just wanted to mention and uh, i think how oh, i am doing with the time so i think so we still have some time probably a couple of minutes couple of minutes okay so so you know like let me just go back to this uh, chemical kinetics again this enzymatic reaction so this is the very classic michaelis maintain uh, reaction so we have this uh, uh, substrate and enzyme reversibly binding getting this uh, metastable state from there you know like it can unbind or form a catalyst so it just i wanted to for you know like emphasis on the fact that when rest restart is exactly equivalent to the unbinding because when it uh, when it unbinds 
the enzyme is again free to operate on any other other substrates for that matter and you know like the the, the chemical reaction will start again so uh, i will i'll just keep most of the things here and i just basically show that uh, you can write in principle again the same renewal equation and can derive and uh, rederive essentially many of the uh, results which were done before okay but what is what is the usefulness of this particular approach why i'm doing it so to do that i just let me just take a few more minutes and just want to tell you something about it so this is a very classic ex uh, experiment which was done by uh, from sanisi group uh, back like 10 10 12 years back uh, so there this enzyme which is basically tethered over here and then then there were the you know, substrate molecules coming in with different concentrations and the fluorescent molecules were getting forms, uh, they were getting formed, and then they were, these are basically called turnover, turnover times. And the turnover times essentially were plotted as a function of, you know, like it's a, the distribution of frequency. And as you can see, if it is a simple Michaelis maintain kinetics, right? So they have, we know that they, are, they should be exponential. Okay. So because you can, you can, you can imagine this, this as a, just a three state Markov process. Complete every complete all the equations using simple master equation. You get exponential solutions, and this is what we are, they were doing. For it seems for low concentration, things were fitting very well. But you know, like because it was sort of a rate limiting process. But as concentrations keep on kept on increasing, they could show uh, they could show basically that there is a strict deviation from the exponential behavior. Okay. So what, what was sort of attributed to this? So they, they say that there is something called a dynamical disorder which are causing this. So dynamical disorder essentially could be of many nature. So the, the way I can imagine this, it we could be of two possible ways out of many others is basically one is called intermediate. So let's say that you have this simple process, right? You have the simple mechanism, mechanism maintained A, B, C, right? So you have the simple going from B to C by just simple rate, K, cat. And this eventually this should give you the double the, the exponent the exponential functions and should have fitted with the experiments, which is not the case, right? So then it could be that actually between B and C there are multiple intermediates, right? So you could have C1, C2, and all. And then it, what, what is happening here that then this K cat is no more an exponential process, but it is actually happening non-exponential process, right? So you see that these are not any more rate processes. So you should be thinking about B to C as uh, not a simple rate process, but an arbitrary stochastic process where the time is coming from some distribution. So you, let's say that you don't know what is happening between B and C, but you just see that the times, the, the catalysis time essentially is not exponential anymore. And this can also happen, you know, like for parallel pathways where, you know, like uh, there could be many different ways of uh, reaching different type of products. And also you can show that this can also give rise to different type of, you know, like uh, dynamical disorder sort of thing okay, and uh, non-exponential times. So the, the reason is when you have exponential times, you can actually use the master equations. But when you have non-Markovian times, you cannot use master equations, right? Because the system, these are not uh, rate processes and you cannot really use it. These are non-Markovian, these are not Markovian systems. So you cannot use the uh, master equations. So you don't really know how to solve them. So we see that the, the approach, uh, the renewal approach, which we have been talking about, is can be a very essential tool, a very essential tool here, because you see that we do not really care about whether it's a Markov process or a non-Markov process. We can deal these processes by just considering general arbitrary waiting times. And, uh, and then you can, you, can, you can write the renewal equation, you can close these relations and get the mean, get the fluctuations and things like that. Okay, so I think uh, just a take home message from here was, I just wanted to demonstrate that, you know, like for simple Michaelis maintained process where everything is dominated by rates, you can write master equations, you can solve them, no issues. But people have seen by doing different type of precision experiments over the years, there could be non-exponential turnover times. And the reason for one that there, there, are, there have been many reasons attributed to this. So for these kind of different reasons, one of them was non-Markovian times. Yes. Non-Markovian times cannot be captured by simple master equation formalism 
Well, if you can connect it to the way we have tried to connect it with the resetting framework, you can actually use the, the framework to, to capture different type of statistical moments uh, for turnover times uh, for different type of processes. And I'm not getting into the this, uh, details of this, uh, but I think I'll just stop here. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say a few things about uh, queues. Uh, if I will be, you know, like I will be given like five, six minutes, maybe. Mm, maybe, uh, yeah, that's fine. I may have to just myself. Uh, uh, but then maybe I will just stop, you know, like no worries. So I just stop here. Okay, so I, I think I just just wanted to say that uh, as I have tried to convince you, you know, like resetting events are sort of ubiquitous in nature, and then they emerge emerge as natural events in many different processes. So while for diffusive system, colloidal systems, or if you are trying to do an experiment with colloidal particles, you probably have to engineer a resetting protocol, okay, which somewhat can seem arbitrary. But in other kind of setups, at least in some of the setups which I demonstrated, uh, for example, chemical kinetics or facilitated diffusion, resetting is already there. Any kind of unbinding or backtracing event can be actually manifested as resetting events. Then you can use this beautiful renewal framework and you can get many things, uh, many exact results from this. So the, one of the one hallmark properties of resetting usually is that resetting can expedite completion of many arbitrary stochastic processes. And in other words, we can design different type of strategies based on resetting, which can help us, you know, like for faster completion of any processes. I did not really have time to talk about applications to economics and molecular simulations, which we have been trying for last uh, couple of years. Uh, so I will just stop here and just say that, okay, there are two different aspects of basically two sides of resetting phenomena. One is basically the spatial behavior, which I started with. And then there is a general temporal behavior, the general framework, uh, which you can use in many different uh, setup. And they are all connected to each other. I did not uh, get time to talk about the queuing application, uh, but then there are also applications in operation research and things like that. Uh, we are trying to spearhead also in this, in kind of, uh, in this, along these directions. So, and again, you know, like it's a great, a great pleasure to acknowledge some of the people with her, whom I have worked in the last couple of years, some sort of uh, funding, uh, acknowledgement to some sort of funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for a very, very stimulating talk, which spanned a number of disciplines. Are there questions? Maybe I can start with one. Um, in algorithms and computer science, many times people think about what, uh, how randomness uh, can essentially improve performance. And I'm just wondering if in addition to randomness, you also had reset or restart, uh, can you also improve performance? And typically one thinks about search um, and min cut problems and so on and so forth. Have you thought about it? Have other people thought about it? Um, yeah, 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 actually there is there was just one paper uh, on this topic, just this, uh, I think on uh, Monday, <laughs> so on archive. So basically uh, the, I, I did not really get time to look into this. They are doing molecular dynamics. Okay, they have multi, any number of molecules and they are also looking for the time it takes for the molecules to, you know, like connect and uh, form a product, bigger product, some sort of a bulk. And they were trying to, so this paper was all about how you can facilitate the runtime algorithm using resetting. Uh, and there was one paper, and then there was, uh, there was another paper in Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulations, I think last year, where they have also tried to come up with the, uh, resetting kind of strategies uh, to uh, you know, come out of different trapments you know like you have different traps where the molecules can get trapped between different colloids and all so they were trying to take the particles out by doing resetting algorithm so there are there are at least a couple of works but uh, it's not much uh, like the way we have made progress analytically for in the static context of statistical physics or stochastic process but i think it, it will be a new opening we have tried to use some sort of a simulation methods, like some sort of incisive method uh, in an active matter system very recently. Um, uh, so 
yeah so it's still a countable number of folks not much yeah 